Hello, reading friends, and thanks for joining me. Today, let's spend a few minutes with The Phenomenon of Man by Pierre Tillyard de Chardin. Uh, this book was originally published in 1955 in France, and I read an English language translation by Bernard Wall with an introduction by Julian Huxley that was published in 1959. So, yes. The Phenomenon of Man by Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin was a Jesuit priest, and this book was prohibited to be published by the Catholic Church during his lifetime. But fortunately for us, meaning all of humankind, he left this manuscript to a friend of his, and so it was published after his death in France in 1955. But, um, you know, I wanted to read this. This book gets referenced, has been referenced in several other works that I've read. And I've just heard about it for a long time. And I just wanted to, to go ahead and, and give it a read. It was not an easy read. This book took me a while to get through. It's not that big, but it's dense. And it's a little confusing to follow. So I did want to give a bit of a disclaimer right here at the beginning that I'm not qualified to teach this book. This book would likely has been actually a whole course unto itself. It's one of those books that you know you could study and, and uncover many different layers and many different meanings. I've read this book one time and so this video is just going to be a brief sort of chat about my takeaways and my experience of reading this book for the first time. But I will go over some key points that I took from the book that I think are important and just sort of how I interpretate, interpret those points and how I'm sort of how I sort of integrated those into my thoughts. So let's just jump into it. So this book, so P, uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin was a Jesuit priest, as I mentioned. He was also a noted paleontologist. So he had a scientific background and was active in this paleontology community, scientific community. And so this book, at, at, at least a large part of this book, concerns evolution, the evolution of different animals, really the evolution of life on Earth itself, and the different ways that that has, or the ways that that has actually happened. And this really, he describes, I took away as sort of a progression from the simple to the more complex. Um, you know, and I guess it could be argued in this book that he's arguing that the phenomenon of man is sort of the pinnacle of that complexity in our consciousness more so than in our physical evolution. He talks about the, you know, like, so for, for animals, if animals are separated onto islands and separated from each other before too long, before you know, too long in geological terms or biological terms or evolutionary terms, they differentiate into other species. This did not happen with humans. So this has not happened with humans. There have been some different species or different types of humans like Neanderthals and others, but, you know, humans were able to actually, we know now through genetic studies, before the, after this book was written, that humans and Neanderthals actually interbred. And so while they were different, they could still interbreed. And most often, different species, I, my understanding is they don't interbreed. Well, anyway, so humans differentiated more in their consciousnesses, their ethnicities, their cultures, their civilizations, than they did biologically. So biologically, even though humans spread over the entire world and there are pockets of humanity that have been separated from um, the rest of us for thousands of years, we are all still one human species. And he calls this sort of human uh, consciousness uh, sphere, he calls it the newosphere. And what this is, if you think about like the atmosphere and the biosphere, the noosphere is the sphere of consciousness around the whole earth. Um, and so we share a common sort of noosphere. And so the noosphere um, is something that's continuing to evolve as human consciousness continues to evolve. And so this um, he talks about in the book where 
over you know centuries ago we were very isolated so the newosphere was very fragmented but as time has gone on and humanity has connected with each other across the entire globe now since this this book was written in 1955 so of course before the digital digital era that we live in now where it's even exponentially probably greater than it was in 1955 with radio and television at that time um, you know now we are connected together in a new sphere like never before in history and so this is contributing to a greater complexity of the new sphere as different uh, people around the world um, are connected and plugged into sort of a global kind of new sphere if that makes sense where we were fragmented before but now you know we are we have been evolving over the centuries to be more and more connected and and you know now i think we are uh, you know very connected but he argues we'll continue to be to become more so even so he talks about the within and the without in this book so the within and the without which is like a cell if you take the example of something very simple like a cell you know it has a without meaning its behavior what the cell does um how long it lives you know just sort of this scientific knowledge now the scientific knowledge is mostly a, a, a knowledge of the without how things act and what are the properties what are they composed of this is all the without but then there's a within and so the within is why does the why does the cell do what it does like why does the cell aggregate or even on the level of elementals you know why do the atoms why do the quantum level um, forces act the way they do why do they unite the way they do and combine the way they do so that we get elements and then we get molecules and the molecules combine we get multicellular we get cellular organisms we get multicellular organisms and finally you know this complexity leading up to a, a complex consciousness like ours and so this within and without he talks about that um, throughout this book um, Another thing I wanted to mention was the personalization of the individual. This is, again, sort of that concept I took away from it, sort of like the within and without. So our individuality is our personalization. So this is us becoming the person we are. So each person is really different. So each consciousness is unique. Each human consciousness is really unique because it's based on its own set of experiences, its own set of um, um you know history and so its own sort of development and so personalization is becoming more you uh, it's developing more you it's it's just becoming you know the, a bigger a, I mean a better a more complicated you um, and so this though this is your within and then there's without which is society and our connection to society and so he argues in this book that you know if you think you're going to have this ego driven where it's your selfishness you're if you're behaving in sort of a selfish way you might be developing your within to the detriment of your without um, and then if you don't develop, if you live for the society and you don't develop your within then you know you, you so in other words you need to to really do both in order for humanity to he calls it I'm going to mispronounce this probably, but he calls it hominization. Hom so it's like hominin, like the species, hominin, hominis, homininization. And so this is the becoming of humanity becoming more of itself. So as an individual, you know, this personalization, you're becoming more you. You're, be, you're developing yourself, you're self-developing, and you're becoming, you're taking what's you, what's unique to you, and becoming more you. And then the hominization is then your interaction then with the rest of the species, the rest of the world, the rest of the universe, but definitely the rest of humans, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an evol evolution of hominization. Ultimately, he talks about an omega point or a point in the future. It, also, he calls this a, sort of same concept I gathered, ultra hominization hominization which is ultra meaning that humanity has evolved its consciousness to the point that it reaches an omega point which is a point of sort of unity with 
conscious with the bigger consciousness right so all consciousness so like the, the, almost basically the divine this omega point then if we hit that omega point we would no longer be human we would be something else so we would we would be at that point he argues perhaps a different species we would no longer be human we would have done all we could do as humans and now we would be something else that's how i understood that um yeah, so one thing before I run out of time, this human evolution as convergence versus divergence. So again, this is that concept of, of evolution as for as for like animals and plants, it's divergence, right? This has been splitting off into other species and developing into new species when they're separated. But humans is sort of a convergence. Our evolution of consciousness has been one of coming together. So we are one species, but we're coming together in sort of one unitary consciousness overall we have our ultra our inter inner our within consciousness but the the greater human human consciousness if that makes sense um is coming you know is developing towards this omega point i hope that makes sense it was kind of confusing for me in the book but i slogged through and i'm glad because i got a really big payoff um because i think i really took away some important concepts from this book finally i wanted to mention love as the primary creative force of harmonization. So love, he talks about love is the energy that causes us to stick together. So, you know, there's some force that causes cells to want to aggregate. For humans, what causes us to want to aggregate is love. And so when you see, he's a Jesuit priest, so he kind of frames this in Christian terms, but if you see another person and you know you might not know them but if you can love them on the level of sort of like a divine love or this love energy you see in them a person you feel connected to them somehow love is the connection between families between sort of social groups and things you know it's what binds friends this is what binds humans together love is this energy this creative force of binding together of convergence. So I thought that was real cool. Finally, I'm almost out of time. I just did wanted to read this one quote here um, that he's talking about personalization. He says, let us reflect a moment and we shall soon see that for a universe which by hypothesis we admitted to be a collector and custodian of consciousness. The mere hoarding of these remains would be nothing but a colossal wastage. If you hoard yourself it's a colossal waste, wastage. What passes from each of us into the mass of humanity by means of invention, education, and diffusion of all sorts is admittedly of vital importance. I have sufficiently tried to stress its phyletic value, and no one can accuse me of belittling it. But with that accepted, I am bound to admit that in these contributions to the collectivity, Far from transmitting the most precious, we are bequeathing, at the utmost, only the shadow of ourselves. I think that's just so cool. It's like become the best you and then go out there and share yourself with the world and that's how we're going to evolve. I think that's so cool. That's so cool. So yeah, The Phenomena Man, not an easy read, but I, I really did get a lot from this book and I'm so glad I finally got it read. My next chat is going to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to have a little bit of American science fiction from 1951, Foundation by Isaac Asimov. I should have a chat on this up pretty soon. So until next time, take care. Bye.